So when you start to look at SAP pH, or you start to look at you know aluminum content in the plan, there's oftentimes a cation exchange component to it. So any any of you that are a big firm fan or are familiar with the work of William Albrecht that really got into oxygen and hydrogen balance in the soil and how to open up soils through calcium applications and provide a good amount of you know root penetration into heavy soils. So if those are out of balance, oftentimes we see the, the SAP pH is very, very low. We'll see the SAP EC will also be very, very low. And we may see a corresponding aluminum toxicity or something of that nature. If we have an aluminum issue and we know that it's there, we can begin to actually start to apply phosphorus judiciously and in the right form so that we can start to take the aluminum out of the plant. And that is what we refer to as managing the phosphorus to aluminum ratio. Really key component because as many people know, NPK, P, in my personal opinion, has more, has done more for, for my own personal growing of better crops than nitrogen ever has. And I know a lot of other conventional guys out there, they, you know, they, 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 they've seen over the years, yeah, you really need phosphorus. And 100% of the is correct. But what a lot of people forget is that there's hundreds of pounds of phosphorus underneath the, underneath the, the roots of the plant. And if you get into our total digest soil analysis, you can start to realize, like, yeah, we might have 800 or 900 pounds of phosphorus or, or more, but it's all tied up. Can't access it, right? So what's that coming from? A lot of times it's carbon shortage. A lot of times it's root aeration, other ratios, silica, calcium, copper. So if the aluminum ratio is, is, is starting to go high, you can start to manage it through phosphorus and maintain the, the, the plant health of the, of the crop, even though you've got issues with phosphorus uptake. You can still manage it through foliar applications or spirits. But we prefer growers to access it through through biological means because what we've seen is you're going to get if you apply the right approach to putting phosphorus on the ground you actually get more phosphorus out of the soil profile itself than you put in and i think we may have touched on that a little bit last week in the, in the healthy soils jim pingry is kind of a master of doing that anyway foliar applications of micronutrients based on immobile indicators on the on the detailed comparison report is another tool against the aluminum stress, right? So a lot of times, like I mentioned before, at low pH values, aluminum is going to make make micronutrients locked in the low in the lower leaf. All of a sudden, we've got an indicator. We can start to apply foliar micronutrients and get get those those levels bumped up in the plant. If we're understanding that plants are in, under root stress. There's an opportunity for microbiolo microbiological synergy with our nutrient applications. That's one of the key components that a lot of people don't get, right? Is that, you know, they say microbes this and the microbes that, and they want to focus on the fact that microbes are, you know, relatively understudied and, and, and so on. But at the end of the day, it's very seldom that, you know, micronutrients that you might purchase on the open market will harm your roots. Very, very rare. They'll typically help. And that's what a lot of them are designed to do. So if we're utilizing microbes and then we're buffering our antagonisms, then we're monitoring root stress, all of a sudden we're able to optimize nutrient delivery to the plant from both the soil profile applications through you know, liquid bands or dry, dry bands through foliar applications and do it intelligently and precisely. So uh, this topic, I, I gave a, I gave a, I gave a presentation a, a little over a month ago at the Soilcraft Conference in Washington on mineral nutrition and plant susceptibility was the title, and you know it was a really interesting presentation from from my perspective because it's the first time I've ever really given one like that where we really just only went right down into the meat and potatoes of here. Take a look at plant data sets in the leaf analysis that show visible symptoms, whether it's chlorosis, metal sclerosis, leaf, leaf imbalances, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also look at the corresponding disease that was present in those plants. So for instance, we were looking at, you know, blighted tomatoes and the cor corresponding potassium deficiency 
or aluminum excess or chloride excess and so on and so on and so forth. There's a whole lot to understanding and unlocking the disease vectors as they're being expressed and influenced and encouraged by nutrient imbalances. But there's a few pieces here on the slide that definitely we've seen. So if potassium is excessive, a lot of times that you have soft fruit. If, if sulfur is excessive, a lot of times that, that leads to a storage drop. A lot of literature out there talks about the co correlation between aluminum levels and root pathogens. And there's been a less, let us, a little bit lesser known research in, in how chloride is associated with high levels of mildews and rusts, both in, you know, uh, high dollar value crops, as well as large acre crops. We've also seen that when sodium is high and aluminum is also high, correspondingly, there's oftentimes going to be a problem downstream. You know, we had a fair amount of growers that'll, you know, that'll call in, they'll run a leaf test, they'll get a recommendation, they'll, you know, they'll have a talk with, with somebody from the office here, myself, on the phone, and they'll say, yeah, you know, my boss doesn't want to spray anything right now. You know, it looks like, you know, it looks like from the leaf analysis says that, you know, we should, you know, our chloride's high. You know, we're just going to, you know, spray a fungicide and, and, you know, we'll be good, right? Well, lo and behold, a lot of times those, those folks call back a couple of weeks later and say, well, you know, we've actually got a lot bigger problems now. We went from one disease to two or three or one disease to now we have one disease and two pests and the plants start to go downhill. So there's a real key and it's a bit of an art form and, under, and misunderstood that nutritional influences are key to un unpacking both resistant plants, but also understanding them, the, the converse of susceptible plants as being excessive in one or more unwanted nutrients. So taking it one step further, insect damage. The ratio of nitrogen to molybdenum or the ratio to phosphorus to manganese, oftentimes we've seen these associated with insects predation. And one of the things that we've developed over the years is a, you know, a bit of a unique approach to insects. And, you know, my personal belief is that oftentimes consuming insects or herbivorous insects are there to feed, they actually feed on and gain a huge amount of nutrients from what the plants can't process. So in other words, if you're feeding a plant an excessive amount of nitrogen, and then all of a sudden you see a insect show up, oftentimes we're finding that those insects are feeding on the nitrogen 